today, I would like to address the question of what happens when we leave this church, when we go down the aisle of the church and out the front door after we have celebrated the Mass and received the Holy Eucharist. How do we carry out of this place and into our homes and into the world what we've experienced here? The church has spoken about this question for many centuries. St. Paul, writing to the people of Corinth where there was a great deal of tension, confronted the wealthy of Corinth because immediately after the Eucharist, they were gathering together to celebrate a meal. And they were brought lavish things, wine and great food. But the poor who had joined them at the Eucharistic table did not have those great rich foods that the rich were eating immediately after the Eucharist. And so Paul chastised them, not in just a little bit, but pretty strong confrontation about how they had kind of fractured the assembly by not living the Eucharist after they had left, after the the kind of liturgy of the Eucharist had finished. In the Acts of the Apostles, the very earliest days of the church, uh, the leaders of the church said, you know, we're, we're finding ourselves torn. We are dedicated to the prayer of the table and to the liturgy of the word, and so we're going to elect deacons to take care of the needs of the widows and the orphans and the poor in our community. A clear connection between what happens at the Eucharistic table and how we reach beyond that to the needs of the poor. So in the biblical narrative, there are very clear examples of connecting the prayer of the Lord's table to the action of living in the world. St. Augustine, who's living in um, North Africa, Italy in North Africa, born in about 258 in North Africa, is, uh, moves to Italy, is educated there, uh, converted by St. Um, Ambrose in Milan, and then eventually becomes the Bishop of Hippo in North Africa. We see these, I, I just recently uh, saw this beautiful mosaic of, of St. Augustine, who's this white European. Certainly, St. Augustine was a black man, but um, we Europeans like to think of ourselves that everybody looks and thinks like us, but Augustine was a great theologian, a powerful preacher and teacher, Augustine said that the fruits of the liturgy are threefold. We gather together for the Eucharist that we may love one another with greater devotion. So we come to the Eucharist together as ourselves to encourage and to nourish one another so that we may enhance our relationship with God individually and collectively. So we gather together for ourselves. We gather together for one another so that our love for one another may be enhanced in the presence of the Lord. Augustine says, further, we gather together for the Eucharist so that we may give a sign of unity in Christ Jesus to the world. We are his people. He feeds us with his body and his blood. We are united in that, and we give um, a sign to the world and still do. You know, this is what Catholics do. This is how we live our lives. This is how we pray in a very particular kind of way. Others know that about us. And so, in a sense, we could say it works. What Augustine said works. It's a sign, what we do here is a sign that we share common traditions. We share music. We share share these prayers. We share the ways together that we come before the Lord. And thirdly, Augustine says, we come together for the Eucharist so that we may flourish in works of charity that we may go beyond ourselves and into the life of the world, that threefold purpose of the Holy Eucharist. Down the centuries, the echoes of St. Augustine's teachings have motivated Catholics in every place to undertake huge, a huge variety of social outreach from the very earliest days of the church, orphanages, food and shelter and hospitality, schools, universities and hospitals counseling services, care for the sick and the dying and the imprisoned, care for the indigent and the refugee. The church has always been at the frontier of caring for those who are most marginalized and most in need of assistance, sometimes in large public institutions. You know, one of the oldest institutions in Paris, the, you know, on the Ile de Cité in Paris is the, is the Hotel de Ville, which is not a hotel at all, but a hospital one of the oldest hospitals in Europe, still functioning 
today. It's a way to outreach out. The church reached out to the poor. That's a, I was originally a Catholic institution. Sometimes our outreach is in private, small gestures to our neighbors, to our friends, to the poor, hidden in our own midst, in our own circle of influence. Sometimes we do these great works of charity with the support of the world. We get attention for what we do. Sometimes the great um, awards that we receive um, for our service to the poor um, come to us in, in great accolades. But sometimes what we do comes under great threat and even persecution. Hiding Jews, for example, when Catholics hid Jews in Poland, they died by the thousands because they were acting on their faith. These Polish Catholics, priests lined up in the street, slaughtered by the hundreds in the streets of Poland in the first days after the Nazi occupation there. Under great threat and persecution, these holy people and elsewhere in the world carried out um, their faith and carried out the command to manifest the Eucharist well beyond the church building. For almost 2,000 years, Catholics have left Mass and gone into the world to carry out what the church has always called the corporal works of mercy. You may have memorized those corporal works of mercy, maybe not, when you were preparing for confirmation. Their list, you know, when you go to Storm Lake St. Mary's and the beautiful stained glass windows that surrounds the sanctuary are the spiritual and corporal works of mercy. The corporal works of mercy deal with the body, feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, ransom the captive, bury the dead, shelter the stranger, comfort the sick, clothe the naked. In the ancient tradition of the church, these are deeply rooted in Jesus' own words. You know, when Jesus gathered, he gave this great parable, and he said, you know, at the end of time, the great king is going to gather the nations before him, and he will separate the nations from sheep from the goats, and then he talked to them about what they did in their lives, whether or not they did these things. Did you feed the hungry? When you fed the hungry, you fed me. When you clothed the naked, you clothed me, Jesus says. When you cared for those who were sick, you cared for me. When you visited prisoners, you visited me. And to those who didn't do that, who were completely oblivious to the opportunity and the obligation to serve Jesus in the world, they said, we didn't even see you hungry. We didn't even see you naked. We didn't see you in prison. And Jesus said, when you refused or did not do this for one of the least ones, you did not do it for me. For those who have a vision, for those who see the needs of Jesus in the world, who clothe the naked and visit the imprisoned, come, enter the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And for those who are blind and deaf to the needs of those around them, you are lost already, Jesus would say. Go to the place of the dead, for you are dead already. That's a paraphrasing of what Jesus says. But deeply rooted in the words and example of Jesus, these important works are outward manifestations of the gift of the Eucharist. This is my body given for you. This is my blood poured out for you. It's not possible for us to reduce the Holy Eucharist to just a meal or a supper with friends. Integrally tied to the Eucharist is the cross, where Jesus stretched out his arms between heaven and earth, in the sign of the covenant, I bind myself to you, and you bind yourself to me in the gift of the cross. The cross and the Holy Eucharist are tied integrally to one another, broken and poured out for the world. The true and immortal question of mass goers, attendees, is not just that we are here. Not just that we've taken time out of our weekend to come to this place. That's good and beautiful and wonderful. And I'm glad you're all here. It's really wonderful. But how does our presence here, week by week, make a difference in how we live in the world? What happens when we leave this place? The command of Jesus to both see and serve the poor and the wounded and the outcast in the world is as fresh today as it has ever been. As I have done, so you must do, Jesus says, as he washes the feet of his disciples. Take care of the least of your brethren, Jesus says. Share your bread with the hungry, Jesus commands. 
These are just a few of the ancient commands that Jesus sprinkled throughout his New Testament narrative. There are dozens of them. When we gather, when we pray, when we listen and respond, when we process and receive the body of Christ, the very body and blood of our Lord, Jesus wants to touch our hearts. He wants to transform our lives. At the end of our gathering, each Sunday, each day, either the priest or the deacon says at the end of Mass, he begins with kind of shouting out a command. Go in peace. Another version. Go and serve the Lord with your life. And the third one, go and announce the gospel. The greeting from the ancient Latin text is, ite mise est. It is from this phrase that we get the word mass. A more accurate description or translation of the text is, go, you are sent into the world. What are we sent into the world for? What are we sent into the world to do? This gathering and this hour is not just about a me and Jesus experience. It's about me and Jesus, of course, but it's about us and about the world, especially the needy in the world. Our wounded, our wounded world is hard to miss. Broken families, these days in particular, the horror of war, hunger, and violence. The desperation in our cities, in our communities, and in our own town, the desperation of addiction and obsession. The fear of refugees and the immigrant poor. The anxiety of the dying and the homeless who are virtually alone. If we choose, we can see the aching needs of the world all around us. Our wounded culture, our desperate brothers and sisters are at the door like Lazarus from the parable of Jesus, yearning to eat from the scraps of our table. In the gospel passage, immediately after the resurrection of Jesus, he goes back to the upper room to encounter his disciples. He passes through the locked door and stands in their midst. And the first thing he says to them is, receive peace, peace be with you, peace be with you. And then he breathes on them. St. Thomas was not in the upper room when Jesus came that first Easter evening. He refused when the disciples told him about their encounter. He refused to believe that Jesus was there. He said, unless I touch the nail part, nail marks on his hand, unless I can insert my hand into the wound in his side, I cannot believe. A week later, Jesus came again. And this wonderful saint, who is always called Doubting Thomas, touched the wounds probed the wound in his side. What a wonderful example for all of us. Thomas's mission as an apostle is sealed because he dares to probe the wounds of Jesus. Jesus is wounded in our families. Jesus is broken and wounded in the troubled of our cities and our nation and the world. Jesus is wounded in war and violence. Jesus is wounded by prejudice and division. We must have the courage to probe the wounds of Jesus in our own community and in our own time. Our wounded world, nourished by the gift of the Holy Eucharist, is a challenge for us. He sends us from this place into the world like Thomas. Probe the wounds. Find Jesus in the midst of the broken and outcast of the world. As St. Augustine said again, three centuries ago, the Eucharist is given to us so that we may be spiritually nourished and lifted up. The Holy Eucharist is given to us that we may be united in faith and in purpose as a holy church. And the gift of the Eucharist is given to us that we may share ourselves with the broken and the wounded of this place 
and this time and this hour. As the last greeting of Mass shouts out, Go in peace, glorifying the Lord with your lives.